Shalom, shalom, Yisrael. It's your brother, Benaiah Ben Israel, coming to you with our New Orleans Conference presentation. This is our New Orleans Conference presentation called Hebrew Case Files. Now, the purpose of this presentation is simply to answer a question. What's the difference between an African American and a present day Jew? A while back, I saw a YouTube video where a traditional Christian pastor asked a simple question. He said, how does one go from being an African American to a Jew? After all, these appear to be two totally different people today. When we think of African American, we think of someone that's dark skinned, that looks like a, a native African, native born African, you know, black curly hair. And when we think of a present day Jew, the most common picture that pops up is a European. So again, he has a fair question. How does one go from being an African American to being a present day Jew? Well, let's answer that question. We're going to answer that question. And to do that, we're going to use scholastic books, scholastic materials. And in particular, we like using books that are older than the 1900s. So when you open up a book and you look at the at the title page and you also look at the publication date. I like we like using books with a publication date of the 1800s or older. And the reason why we do that is because the newer books tend to have a different history uh, than the one then compared to the ones that are older. And of course the ones that are older um, it was they were made during a time when there was no ambiguity or when there was no confusion as to who the Jews were and what they looked like. So that is why we use the older references. So what I like to do in, in a lot of these presentations, I always like to start off by reading a few descriptions of the Jews according to the old references. And I do that just so that we can level set and we can reprogram our minds as to what the Jews look like according to the old references. And then from there, we can get into some additional references that tell us what happened to the Jews. But let's first start off by taking a look and reviewing the references that describe the Jews according to the old references. And just one side note, I'm not going to read every single reference as far as like the title and the author and the publication date. If you could please uh, just check out my website, https colon forward slash forward slash Benaya, that's B-E-N-A-Y-A-H four, you know, the number four, Israel dot org. That's https colon forward slash forward slash Benaya for Israel dot org. And if you go there, um, you should be able to find the references for this video. If you don't see them right away, just check back a week or two later and y'all willing, I will have the references for this video on that web page. All right. Praise y'all. OK, well, let's get started. Let's go through. Let's first go through a couple of videos which show or describe the complexion or the physical description of the Jews according to the old references. All right. So in this first reference, it reads, Thus the Jews are a people who have ever, according to the prophecy, dwelt alone without intermixing with the nations to this day. Now, this separate race all descended from brown ancestors. For Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must, has been, must have been as dark as Mar Yohanan, if not darker. Exhibit every shade of color from the black Jews of Malabar, of whom, of whom we have such an interesting account by Dr. Claudius Buchanan, to the rose and lily complexion of the Jews on the banks of Elip, which was uh, Germany, I believe. We need to go or we need go no further than the Jews of southern Spain and compare them with those of Holland and northern Germany to perceive a very striking difference. It says the the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. I'll say that again. It says the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. 
and his hair is uniformly black. While as the German Jews is often fair as any German and has light or red hair with blue eyes. All right. So the purpose of reading this reference is to show that the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion, always dark complexion. And I do want to note that in this video, we are going to we are going to focus exclusively on the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews. And the reason why we do that is because the, this is where the transatlantic slave trade started, right? The transatlantic slave trade started with these two nations. So we are going to zero in and take a look at the description of the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews during and before the time of the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, well, let's move on to our next reference. You can see our reference there where it says a new voyage to Italy. And in this reference, it reads, and I'm going to jump down a little bit in our highlighted section where it says, tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. Let's read that again. It says, "'Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews, who marrying always, who marrying always among one another beget children like themselves. And consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even to the northern regions." All right, well, this is yet another good reference which shows us that the Jews are all black. In particular, the Portuguese Jews are all black. So let's keep going. Our next reference here, and I'm actually just going to read on the right hand side. I believe it's on page 66 near the top. And actually, let me back up here. I'll start at the bottom on the left where it says, a remarkable fact in the history of Luango in the Empire of Congo is that the country, according to a statement which was fully credited by Oldendorp, himself a writer of most correct judgment and of unimpeachable veracity, contains many Jews settled in it, who retain their religious rights and the distinct habits which keep them isolated from other nations. Though thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble the other Negroes in every respect as to physical character. It is probably an allusion to this case that Pennington in his textbook, another book, says the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea settled on the coast of Africa are black. All right. And actually the section at the bottom, just let's read that really quick where it says the Portuguese was the Portuguese who planted themselves on the coast of Africa a few centuries ago have been succeeded by descendants blacker than many Africans. All right. So again, this is another reference to show that the Jews are black. And in particular, there's the Portuguese Jews who were on the west coast of Africa. Uh, are black and we will read a little bit more uh, about that in later on in this presentation okay now on to our next reference and it reads and it says as i tentatively survey the jewish population on the streets of london i fancy i could perceive three different casts of features the first jewish par excellent and never to be mistaken all right so let's take a look at the first form, with the, which is the Jewish form. And if we skip down, it says, of the first form, I need say little to you, begging you merely to recollect that the contour is convex and the eyes long and fine and the outer angles running towards the temples. The brow and the nose apt to form a single convex line and the nose comparatively narrow at the base, the eyes consequently approaching each other. It says, lips very full, mouth projecting, chin small, and the whole physiognomy, or the way they look, when swarthy, or when black, as it often is, so they're often black, it says, has an African look, has an African look. 
So this is a, a good reference to show us exactly how the Jews look. So before the references merely just touched on color, but I like using this reference because it actually tells us how they looked, right? And it says they looks, the Jews looked African, right? They said they looked African. All right, so let's keep going. Let's go on to our next quote and the narrative's travels and discoveries. You can see it there on the screen. So I'm just gonna forward through to our quote and it reads, and it's going to read, uh, jump a little ways down where it says, You are not Jews, said he. No, said I. Christian then, even so. Or, which means yes. And, oh, just a little bit of uh, background on this quote before we, we finish it. So this is Hugh Clapperton. Um, he's recounting his uh, interaction with a sheik on the west coast of Africa. So he's recounting the conversation that took place. So Hugh Cap uh, Clapperton says, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the sheik asked Clapperton, he says, you are not Jews, said he. And then Clapperton re replies, no, said I. Christian then, says the sheik. Even so, which means yes, replied, Cla replied Clapperton, replied I. And then the sheik says, I have read of you. You are better than Jews, said he. Are Jews white like you? No, replied I. Rather, more like yourself. Very dark. All right. Well, I like using this reference just so that it helps explain or show that the understanding back in the 1800s was that the Jews were black. It's not that the Jews were white. It's that the understanding was that the Jews are black. All right, well, let's keep going. And on to our next quote, which reads and read at the top of the uh, highlighted section. It says, thus the black color is found not only in individuals as the black Jews of Portugal, but in the tribes of the Bacaris on the Red Sea, whose hair and character are perfectly Semitic. All right. So again, uh, this reference is helping to drive home the fact that the uh, understanding in, uh, you know, 200, 300 years ago was that the Portuguese Jews and the Spanish Jews were and are black, right? They are black. All right, so on to our next quote, and this comes from Baruch Spinoza. Now, Baruch Spinoza is a Jew himself. I believe it's, he's, he's a Portuguese Jew. So this is a valuable reference because this is a self-description uh, coming from a Jew, right? So let's see what Baruch Spinoza has to say. And it reads, he was of a middle size. He had good features in his face. The skin somewhat black. Black curly hair, long eyebrows, and of the same color. So that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. Now, the, a good takeaway from this reference shows us that the understanding was that they could tell by the looks of someone that they were a Portuguese Jew. They could tell that if the skin was somewhat black, and the hair was black and curly that he was descended from a portuguese jew that's that's what they associated that look to be that was the look of a portuguese jew all right so let's move on now this um this reference just kind of helps helps shed some light on the description of the jews that were living around the valley of the jordan and it reads with reference to the characteristic of color, which are extreme, we have now opportunities of knowing how much of that character is the result of the influence of climate. Now, and just a side note, so back in the day, they used to think that climate affected whether a person was black or, or white. But um, so we, of course, we know better now, but just know that that was the, the thought process back then. But it says, we know it more particularly by the most valuable mode of teaching such influences which we derive from the peculiarity of the Jewish race. And it reads, for 1800 years, that race has been dispersed in different latitudes and climates, and they have preserved themselves distinct from intermixture with the other races or with other races of mankind. There are Jews, there are some Jews still lingering in the valleys of the Jordan, having been oppressed by the succession, successive conquerors of 
Syria for ages, a low race of people and described by trustworthy travelers as being as black as any of the Ethiopian races. All right. So this is a good reference to show that even the Jews that were living in the Valley of the Jordan, that trustworthy travelers described the Jews as being as black as any of the Ethiopian races. All right. Now on to our next quote. All right, and it reads, actually, let's just jump down to the underlying uh, sentence here where it says, the Jews of Portugal are very dark. All right. So again, that reference is self-explanatory. And even in this index, you can see where it says Jews black, <laughs> Jews black. And that's what we see in this index in the, in the back of this book. All right. So on to our next reference. And this one and this reference comes from John Mackey. And this book was written in the 1700s. And for this one, I believe uh, this book, he was describing uh, like a head of state. And he goes on with his description and he says he hath also the exterior air of business an application enough to make him very capable in his habit and manners, very formal. A tall, thin, very black man, like a Spaniard or a Jew, about 50 years old. All right. So this is a good reference to show you that a tall, thin, black man, that the understanding that that person looked like a Spaniard or a Jew. Now, how different is that from the description or the description that pops in in our minds today when we watch the five o'clock news and they describe a describe a a person of being a tall thin very black man right a, a, a different mindset or a different idea pops into our minds when we hear that on the five o'clock news we definitely don't think of a of a spaniard or a jew today do we? we think of somebody else right but you know in the 1700s when someone said tall thin very black man the idea that came to mind was a Spaniard or a Jew. So you can see that as we go through these references, we are what we're doing is that we're showing that the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews did not look like Europeans. Instead, the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews looked like the so-called African Americans. And once we have this foundation, we are then able to go into the history to see exactly what happened to the Jews just before the transatlantic slave trade and during the transatlantic slave trade to see why the present day Jews and the African so-called African Americans, as well as those that have been scattered via the transatlantic slave trade, you can see why we are all the same people, right? We are all one people. Okay. All right. So we've We've uh, reviewed the color of the Jews or the description of the Jews, and we've proven that the Jews of Spain and Portugal are similar or look just like the so-called African American today. All right. So on to our next section. And in our next section, let's review the home of the Jew. Let me ask you a question. Where did the Jews live? So now that we understand that the Jews are always dark complexion and all black, where do these dark complexion, all black Jews live? Well, let's take a look. Let's first start off by taking a look at the Webster Dictionary. And let's take a look at the word ghetto. And let's take a look at the first uh, definition that says ghetto, a quarter of a city in which Jews were formerly required to live. <laughs> ghetto, a quarter of a city in which the Jews were formerly required to live. So let's cross check our reference by looking at a few other additional references. But so far, according to Webster, the Jews lived in ghettos. So these dark complexion, all black people lived in ghetto. Do, let me ask you a question. Do African-Americans, have we been known to live in ghettos? Yes, we have. Right. Yes, we have. 
Well, let's keep reading. Let's read some additional references. And it says in the 1610s, it says part ghetto, part of a city in which the Jews are compelled to live. All right. It says, especially in Italy from Italian ghetto. All right. So let's keep going. Let's get some additional references, which reads. And it says Venice imitating the odious measures of the German cities assigned to the Jews as a special quarter ghetto. All right. Let's keep going. Let's get some more additional references to see where these dark complexion, all black Jews had to live. And it says Portugal as a former Jewish ghetto or Judearia. And that's one thing to note that in Portugal, the uh, word for ghetto was Judearia, right? And this is where the Jews were required to live. And actually, in fact, today there are places that are clearly marked as Judearia today over in Portugal. So this is where the Jews, these all black, dark complexion Jews had to live. And let's just read one more reference. And it says Jewish quarter known as Judearia. It says in Lisbon, the chief city, there were several Judearias. And in all their cities, Jewish quarters exist, existed. And it says these Judearias were closed every evening when the bell sounded for prayers and were guarded by two watchmen appointed by the king. Any Jew found outside of Judearia after the first three tolls of the bell was fined 10, 10 livres, or according to an order of King Dom Pedro was whipped through the city and in case of repetition of the offense punished with confiscation of his property. So now, just reviewing what we've learned so far, we've learned that the Jews of Spain and Portugal were all black, dark complexion Jews. And we also learned that they lived in ghettos, right? That they lived in ghettos. All right, so now we are starting to see some similarities or hopefully we're seeing some similarities between the so-called African-Americans and the Jews just before the transatlantic slave trade started. All right, so... Now, let's take a look at the names that were used to describe Jews, right? So let's take a look at different names that were used to describe Jews. And to do that, let's first take a look at the word Negro. Let's take a look at the word Negro. So so-called African-Americans today are called Negro, right? Or were called Negro at some point in time. Or we identified as Negroes at some point in time. But let's take a look at the etymology of the word Negro. So according to etymology online and also according to, I believe, it was Webster Dictionary and some other dictionaries, we see that the word Negro in the 1550s, and it's actually in 1555, but in 1550s, it says the word Negro meant a member of a black skinned race of Africa. Uh, I mean, let me read that again. In 1550s, the word Negro meant the member or a member of a black skinned race of Africa. But we can see that before the 1550s, the word Negro meant something else, right? The word Negro meant something else. And we can confirm this not only in the encyclopedias, but we can also con we, we can also confirm this in looking at the etymology of the word. So according to that etymology of the word, it says the word Negro before 1550s meant Portuguese black. The word Negro simply meant Portuguese black, right? And if you want to look at that on a timeline, you can see, you know, from the 1555 to the right, which is up to present day, that the word Negro meant an African people. But to the left, the word Negro, you know, meant, according to the etymology, it meant Portuguese black. But I'll put a couple of question marks here because we don't know what people it was referred to. We know the word Negro meant Portuguese black, but we don't know what people it was referring to. So to answer that question, let's read a couple of references to, to see if we can answer that question. All right. So our first reference, it reads in Portugal, 
the name of a Jew is a term of such high reproach that the government found it necessary to enact a law which forbid any person to call another by that appellation. If a man who is styled a Jew or if a man who is called a Jew to his face stabs the offender, it says the law does not condemn him. And trifling as this regulation may appear, it is it has produced beneficial effects. In other words, it was very effective. So the takeaway from this reference is that the Jews were called by another name because there was a law that prevented people in Portugal from calling a Jew a Jew. Right? So the Jews couldn't be called a Jew. It says they had to be called by a, a different name. Or at least in this reference, it says that the term Jew was such high repro reproach that it was against the law to call a person by that name. So then the question comes, what were the Jews called? Right? What were the Jews called? So to answer that question, let's go on to our next reference. And it reads, King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And it says, from these banished Jews, it says, the black Portuguese, as they are called. All right, it says the black Portuguese, as they are called. So let's note a few things here. It says the banished Jews were called black Portuguese, right? The banished Jews from King John II. So King John II is the king of Portugal, and he's calling these Jews black Portuguese, right? The Jews are called black Portuguese. Well, we need to remember that the Portuguese word for black is Negro, right? So if we go back to our, our uh, etymology of the word Negro, we can see Negro, Portuguese, black, right? We see Negro, Portuguese, black. And, and one thing I do want to point out was that the, um, note the, note the date here. So it's King John II, and this is in 1492. So in 1492, they were called black Portuguese, which is our Negro Portuguese, because remember the Portuguese word for black was Negro. So in 1492, which is before the 1550 date, right? So before the 1550s, right? So remember, look at our uh, our, our um, etymology of the word Negro here. It says Negro, 1550s. So it, before 1550s, we just read a quote that referred that referred to the 1492 so that would be in this box right here and it within this box according to the references says the jews were referred to as portuguese right here black portuguese black which is negro all right so hopefully you can see that the jews were called negroes that was one of the the terms for the jews now let's move on to one of the more controversial names of the jews and to do that, we're going to take a look at a very controversial name. It's a it's a byword. It's a d derogatory word used today, uh, which causes great pain. But the word or this derogatory word is N I G G E R, or pronounced nigger. Now, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it's important for us to realize that it wasn't always spelled with two G's. According to Oxford Dictionary, it was spelled with one G. Uh, especially in the 1500s or 1600s and that it wasn't until recently that it was being spelled or that it was spelled with two G's and so what that means is that the um, anytime you see N-I-G-E-R it is supposed to be pronounced nigger now why are we reading about the Oxford Dictionary and the way that the word nigger was spelled well it's important because According to A.J. Rogers, the slaves that were taken from the Nigger River Delta were called after that name. So in other words, the slaves that were taken from the, you know, what we refer to today as the Niger River. However, back during the time of antiquity, it was called the Nigger River. So slaves that were taken from the Nigger River were called niggers, which was the derogatory name. So in this, um, these quotes or this reference, let's take a look to see what slaves or what people 
We're living around the Nigger River. And for that, let's take a look at John Ogilvy. And this is uh, from his book, Africa Being an, an Accurate Description of the Regions. Now, this book, if you want to find this book today or buy this book today, the hard copy, I believe it's on sale for $20,000, right? $20,000. And you have to wonder, why would a book cost $20,000? Well, of course, it's about the material that's inside these books or the truth that's inside these books. And of course, a price of $20,000 um, helps prevent this book or it prevents this book from making it into mainstream right it prevents this book from being seen by the masses okay so let's take a look at john ogilby's book about africa and on page 34 it reads many jews also are scattered over this region some natives boasting themselves of abraham's seed inhabiting both sides of the river nigger all right so now this reference shows us that on the west coast of africa near the river nigger that the jews were scattered over the region and that they also inhabited both sides of that river right so now we know what people were living in the nigger river region and what people eventually became the slaves however we haven't really prove that these were the uh, slaves just yet we actually have that covered in some other references but for now we're just establishing the fact that it was the jews that lived around the nigger river or lived in the nigger river delta region all right so as we keep going it says others are asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of jerusalem by Vespasian and um oh let me just pause here just to let you know that this this quote also goes into detail to show us that the jews that were living near the nigger river region wasn't just the spanish jews no it was the jews that had fled from jerusalem or the jews that came from jerusalem that the jews that fled or came from jerusalem at different points in time so the jews continuously came from the homeland of Israel into the west coast of Africa. So just know that it wasn't it wasn't a singular event that led the Jews over to the west coast of Africa. Just know that the Jews in waves, you know, in waves, in waves of migration, uh, came over to the west coast of Africa. And this quote actually speaks to that. So it says the some Jews uh, sees others Asian strangers who fled thither from the desolation of Jerusalem by, by Vespasian. So when Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD, the Jews came over to the west coast of Africa. Then it says, or from Judea wasted and depopulated by the Romans. So when the Romans depopulated it later, the Jews fled over to the west coast of Africa. It says Persians. So when the Persians destroyed, um, came against Jerusalem, they fled to the west coast of Africa, Saracens and Christians, likewise. Then it says, or else came out of Europe where they were banished. So the Jews were banished out of Europe, and as they were banished out of Europe, according to our reference, John Ogilby, uh, who was the, the cosmographer and geographic printer of the king. So this is a, one, a person of, um, of authority and he has a has a uh, a seat of authority or he's next to a person with the seat of authority and john ogilby goes also tells us that the jews were kicked out of spain and um, out of the low country in 1350 out of france and out of england and it says they all differ in habit and are divided into several tribes having no dominion though both wealthy and numerous but despised of all nations and so abominated by the Turks that they are not admitted to be Mohammedans. And it says, and then no wise, no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and to gather their taxes. All right. Okay. So just to re let's review, you know, the purpose of reading this reference is just to show you that the Jews that were the Jews, it was the Jews that lived near the Nigger River Delta region. And these were the slaves that were taken from the Nigger River Delta region were called niggers. All right. Well, let's keep reading. So another controversial name, uh, especially in, in Africa, in the continent of, of Africa, is Caffrey or Caffrey. So according to our references, uh, let's read um, this reference by Leo Africanus. And it says, 
the people of this place called in the Arabian tongue, Kafir, Kafirs, or Kafates. That is to say, lawless or outlaws are for the most part exceedingly are exceeding black of color. All right. So we can see that the people that were Kafirs, first of all, they were called outlaws or lawless. That's important that they were, these people were referred to as lawless, right? And if we read the little section below it, it says, these slaves are esteemed its strongest, most robust, courageous, faithful, and obedient in the world. And so are they thus highly prized. It says, they are all Negroes. You see that? They are all Negroes. And the Portuguese call them Kaffirs, which, are, which, you know, according to the reference above it, it means lawless. You get it? Lawless. Which meant that they were Christians, by the way. All right, so let's keep reading. And let's read another reference by Leo Africanus where he goes on to say, he says, Some also think that the people called Caffrey or Caffates at this day who are Gentiles draw their original from the Jews. But being environed on every side by idolaters, they have by little and little swayed from the law of Moses and so are become, as it were, insensibly idolaters. All right. So Leo Africanus goes on to point out that there were many during the time that or there were some during the time that believed the Kaffirs were Jews as well. All right. And that they were lawless, by the way, according to the previous reference. OK, so let's take a quick review of what we've learned so far. So we learned that the Jews of Spain and Portugal were all black or always dark complexion and all black. Right. So this is what we learned. And then we took a look at the we took a look at the place of where these Jews lived and we found out that the Jews lived in ghettos. So these all black, always dark complexion people lived in ghettos, uh, again, just before the transatlantic slave trade, right? Just before the transatlantic slave trade. And then we went on to learn that the Jews were called by different names. We learned that they were called Negroes. And we also learned that they were called niggers, or they were associated with niggers, the term nigger. And then, last but not least, they were also associated with the term Kaffir or Kaffirs, right? All right. So on to our next section. So now that we now that we know that, let's take a look at where did these Jews go? So the Jews, if we don't know, if you don't know, the Jews were in Spain and Portugal in great numbers. So after the Moors and the Jews um, ruled Spain for many years. And we know that they were also in you know, Spain and Portugal because even today, if you go to Portugal, there is a section called Judearia, which is the, called the ghettos, and that's where the Jews live. So we know that the Jews and the Moors were there, right? And they ruled there from 711 AD, roughly to around uh, 1492 AD. But the question is, where did they go? Where did they go? So let's read a couple of references just to get an idea of where these Spanish and Portuguese Jews um, were sent. 